So what I'm going to propose is that we do this somewhat fluidly, that if I may, I will invite Willem up uh, and Paul and Pierre Alain for the next panel. Mariana, if you wish, you can join the next panel. Um, if you don't wish, you can sit back. But I'd like you and Dieter to be very active in the discussion that follows the panel, if I may, so that some of these questions about wealth creation can be picked up and then fused with what we were doing this morning on wealth accounting and wealth management. Because I think uh, we have two sets of ideas here uh, that if we blend them together and meld them together a bit more tightly, we will get some useful, very useful insights. So I hope that is OK. So can I invite, invite the panel to come up? And Marianne, as you wish, you can stay there or you can return to your seat. Um, and we'll get cracking with, uh, thank you very much, with, with the panel on public wealth management because it does naturally follow on from the discussion that we've just had. Um, so the role of the public sector in uh, creating wealth is clearly contested but very important. The role of the public sector in managing the many, many trillions of assets that it has on its balance sheet is also very important. And this panel builds upon work that City has done in one of their GPS pieces uh, that asks the question, perhaps the public sector should just not think quite analytically about which assets it parcels up and allocates to the private sector to, to manage, uh, rather than seeking to manage all of it it's, uh, yeah, of its own accord. So um, I think we have, well, I've been kind of just extemporizing here, as you can see. I think we have a broadly set up panel now. So I'm going to hand over uh, to Willem, who is both going to, in a sense, pseudo chair, but also comment. Uh, uh, in, in, in play, play a kind of um, a double act role, uh, but uh, if that's okay with you, Willem. Yeah, we'll start to disagree with myself. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, uh, the way we value asset value wealth depends, of course, on what we're using it for. Whether it's for normative purposes or for positive purposes. I, in this talk here, am going to be um, very, very pedestrian. I'm simply basically going to ask the question, what is the closest approximation we can practically find to the intertemporal budget constraint of the government? And, and um, uh, in words, how is government constrained in its decisions over time? Um, so I'm not going to address the issue of, uh, you know, uh, well-being and wealth. Uh, remember, incidentally, that uh, in a world without scarcity, right, infinite well-being, there is no wealth and no income. So that's a, a simple sober thing. So we should never think that these two are the same, <laughs> right, ever. So, uh, but um, I'm going to uh, also not, um, I think I'm not, <laughs> not going to spend a lot of time because I think they are not really uh, relevant here, is uh, um, well, is the question of the, uh, of the horizon in question. When I hear about sustainability and I see economists casually putting a little infinite symbol there, I, I, I get worried, right? Because uh, I know about the laws of entropy. I know that the sun is going to burn out in finite time. Uh, the you know, laws of entropy mean that the universe is going to continue expanding and become effectively empty before long. So we have to come up with a number at some point, and the number actually matters, whether we take a hundred, a thousand, or a million, right? So we have to be practical about it. And we can, for theoretical purposes, fudge it by putting infinity in there, but in practice we have to do something else. Um, okay, it's also important, I think, that the same operational, positive purpose of wealth can be used at all levels, not at the national level, right? And the sub-national level, the sectoral level, say the government here, but also, uh, at the level of, uh, of individuals. After all, when we talk about the distribution of wealth and distribution of income, that's what we want to know, right? And uh, so I do not want to limit this to the national accounts and uh, the flow of funds or the national balance sheets, important though they are. Um, uh, the, I view the, in principle, the government in temporal budget constraint as having on the asset side the net present value of all uh, future 
inward cash flows. Right? They can either be associated with physical assets or financial assets actually in the possession of the government, right? That should therefore always be valued in terms of the, uh, of the net present value of the future cash flows rather than historical cost or currently production costs. Um, and uh, uh, this also includes, importantly, of course, the net present value of future taxes, uh, which, uh, if you want, is a, when you, uh, you know, goes into human capital and you take a comprehensive uh, economy-wide view. And on the, uh, um, it includes, on the uh, liability side, all the financial liabilities, off-budget, on-budget. There's no difference between these two. Everything that could conceivably become a liability to the government has to be in there with the probability that it becomes a liability attached to it, valued properly, including contingent liabilities, contractual and otherwise. We should also have in there uh, non-contractual future commitments of the government, like Social Security, uh, which, uh, well, I think, uh, in many ways, very different uh, for the operation of government from contractual obligations, like uh, pensions of state workers, uh, uh, are important to um, study the consistency of alternative scenarios for government spending and revenues. And um, so, and all that then finances the net uh, present value of future public spending on, uh, on uh, transfer payments, as I said, and uh, exhaustive public consumption. Huge problems here, right? What discount rates we use? In practice, we don't know. We don't have the stochastic discount factors. We have to fat finger it, effectively. And uh, it's especially difficult when uh, we don't even know, as, we, as we, is the case today, uh, what a risk-free real interest rate is uh, over maturities up to uh, 10 years or more. It appears to be negative in most, in most economies. It makes the job of discounting over an infant horizon rather, inter rather interesting. Um, so um, um, we should, um, I think it's very important, uh, when we do these accounts and do these balance sheets, uh, um, at least for the, for the flows, that we do them both on a accrual and on a cash basis. Right? Um, governments always love to do uh, you know, uh, taxes on an accrual basis, even when they're not collecting, and uh, um, public spending on a cash basis, even when they're not paying, right? they're going to arrears, but you have to, I think the safe way around it is to do it in both ways. And, um, uh, you know, be very careful when you value debt that you don't fall into the old IFRS trap, which is also shared by IPSAS at the moment still, that you start valuing debt at discount rates that include the probability of default. Right? In this case, an entity, of course, the instant before it goes default, it's always sol in default, it's always solvent because the debt's not worth anything. So to establish solvency, you basically assume that the debt is risk-free and see whether that adds up. And if it isn't, then you know you're not solvent. Okay. Now, governments are now to have um, been particularly poor at allowing for both their assets and their liabilities. Liabilities we know about. There are long reports written on uh, the absence of uh, insurance uh, guarantees, deposit insurance guarantees, uh, other uh, off-budget assets, you know, PPPs that really are just ways of get getting around temporarily uh, uh, debt restrictions uh, and other things like that. But what governments are being equally bad at is not recognizing uh, the value of the, uh, what they call commercial assets. That is simply the value of those assets that can, uh, under certain circumstances, which are politically determined, um, yield positive cash flows in the future. So it could be everything from uh, you know, selling the Acropolis to the Turks, right? Uh, times the probability that that happens, which is zero, right? So that is not an asset with commercial value, to um, letting uh, national parks uh, be exploited for either you know, uh, uh, so sort of the, the forestry or for uh, uh, shale and uh, gas and tight oil extraction, these kind of things. Uh, governments are major landlords at all levels, federal, state, and local, and they are have masses of potentially uh, commercial assets. And uh, the estimate of uh, Debtor & Co. in their publication is that most governments, uh, in the advanced economies at any rate, where we have some data, appear to have more uh, commercial assets in, in value 
uh, with, and this imposes sensible constraints on what can be treated commercially. So it doesn't involve uh, turning Yellowstone into a car, car parking lot, right? So this uh, uh, the sensible constraints, subjective but important, right? the gross assets exceed the gross liabilities. Now, the question is, A, uh, how can we realize that wealth? Right? And B, how come we don't know about it? And um, I'm not normally a conspiracy theorist, I leave that to Donald Trump, but um, I, I do think that's probably one of the reasons that it's uh, so uh, uh, obscure, the value of commercial public assets, is that it, it provides enormous rents to those in the government and uh, their mates in the private sector who are in control of it. Right? So there's a um, uh, lack of transparency is a necessary condition uh, for, uh, for rent extract, for you know, uh, improper rent extraction. And so it happens on a huge scale. So uh, that's one reason. The second is it, it, it's difficult. And the third is the debate has become uh, polarized between those who say um, uh, uh, um, uh, the asset, either the assets aren't there or those who say we have to sell, get them to the private sector. What Detter and co have done is show that there may be ways of looking at the entire portfolio of Com potentially commercially exploitable public sector assets, real assets, commercial assets, and um, uh, uh, that um, may involve privatization in some cases, right? and, uh, um, and, but may also involve um, a, a variety of other arrangements, including sort of on budget and on balance sheet, uh, you know, um, PPAs and PPPs, and uh, um, uh, other ways of doing this. It should be at arm's length from day-to-day -day politics, it has to be political in a transcendental sense, but answer from day-to-day -day politics, these assets located in a sovereign, a commercial sovereign wealth fund that manages them either uh, for cash returns with the individual assets subcontracted in a transparent way to private or other entities, or indeed by uh, selling them uh, to the private sector or by involving in a variety of arrangements, a cooperative, a franchise type arrangement with the private sector. There is a huge relaxation of the intertemporal budget constraint of the government that is possible if you manage the asset properly. And we uh, better get on with it. Sorry. That's it. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I think maybe it is too much of an ask for you to disagree with yourself. So uh, you, can, you can leave that to me. And I, I, it's all rubbish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, let's Next move now to Pierre Alain. Uh, 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 go in um, seating order. Okay. <laughs> okay, fine with me. Thank you. So uh, I, I'm not going to give you here the point of view of a public asset manager, but the point of view of um, uh, of the national accountants. Since currently I work in a national accounts department uh, at the OECD, I, I will try to tell you wh where to find national balance sheets and, in particular, information on public assets what to expect in terms of coverage and tell you what are the typical uh, orders of magnitude for the public sector. So I think that national accounts are probably the best place to start with when, um, when, when looking for such information on uh, public assets because uh, there are detailed international manuals and a long experience in most of the countries around the world, even developed countries, that ensure at least some uh, level of transparency in the compilation process and also international comparability mm -hmm. of the data. Um, <clears throat> so what to look for in these uh, national accounts balance sheets? Uh, if you have in mind a comprehensive acceptation of uh, wealth, you would think at least of five components. First, financial wealth. Second, fixed assets. So uh, either buildings and structures, machinery, equipment, but also intangible assets so, such as computer software and uh, research development. Three, uh, land and subsoil assets. Four, human capital. Five, institutional and social capital. I would say that what you can expect to find in the, in the national uh, accounts balance sheets are the first three components, namely financial wealth, fixed assets, and land and subsoil assets. Nevertheless, um, uh, looking at the, uh, at the accounts actually available country by country, uh, you will have um, a diverse degree of uh, success. 
Let me give you some example. Uh, out of the 34 OECD countries, uh, all except one, New Zealand report either consolidated or non-consolidated financial balance sheets. So you've got a pretty good coverage of the financial assets. Uh, 24 OECD countries provide at least some data on their stock of uh, non-financial assets, so the fixed assets such as buildings and machinery, but only eight OECD countries provide data on land values, uh, and even fewer provide data on subsoil resources. So, uh, since we are in the UK, I just wanted to mention that uh, the UK is not one of the eight countries providing data on land. These eight countries are, are on which I, I will uh, base my, my examples in the following are Australia, Canada, Finland, France, Germany, Japan, Korea, and the Netherlands. Uh, so for these eight countries, uh, I try to look at uh, how much um, uh, the public assets uh, represented. So the, the, the figures are huge for the general government, so the public sectors, uh, th sector as defined in the national accounts. It's in between 100 and 200% of uh, GDP. Uh, the financial assets uh, only make up 70% uh, of GDP only. I say only because it's less than all the non-financial assets representing more or less 100% of GDP. Um, and uh, in this 100% uh, of GDP for um, uh, non-financial assets, you've got 55% of GDP for the fixed assets, and uh, 45 for either land and mineral and energy assets. So the bottom line is that in spite of uncertainty, quite large uncertainty to be frank, in terms of uh, measurement of the value of the non-financial assets, these assets are at least as important as financial assets for the eight countries that we looked at. And in some countries, for instance Australia, subsoil assets play a key role. In some others, for instance Korea, land plays a key role. Um, so, uh, what can we expect now in terms of uh, further development in the, in the coming future? So, until recently, uh, non-produced assets, and I, I mean land and subsoil assets, uh, were not considered as a priority by most national accountants. Nevertheless, uh, uh, we, uh, the, the accountants and the statisticians made recent progress in the field of official uh, statistics with the publication of the system of environmental economic accounts and uh, with uh, the um, compilation of residential property uh, price indices of better quality. Uh, so, because there is more data and because there is also a rising concern about the sustainability of economic development and also pressure for better measurement of economic developments in the real estate sector, you can expect that uh, land values should be uh, compiled more systematically far beyond the, the eight countries I just mentioned. And I, I to to follow up on the explanations that uh, William, uh, William uh, gave, so as to explain that land was so poorly covered in the accounts. Uh, I would like to, to highlight that uh, the, the political uh, priorities play a key role in the, in the development of statistics. Uh, currently in the European Union, uh, the, the political pressure that, that was the case in the last 20 years went into the development of uh, uh, government finance statistics. Uh, they, they, the, the, most of the, of the best resources in the national accounts departments in Europe go into the compilation of uh, government finance statistics and not in the compilation of uh, uh, non-financial wealth because uh, deficit debt and uh, public deficit and public debt were highly and uh, uh, scrutinized by the European Commission and Eurostat. But if the, the, there is a shift in the, in the political priorities towards the compilation of wealth, at least for lands, since the data is there basically, the statistical institutes need to be familiar with it, need to collect it within the public administration, but you, you can expect progress in the short term. It's not exactly the same case for subsoil assets, because 
So uh, here I would like to follow up on something that uh, Glenn Marie told this morning, that GDP and um, uh, wealth were different because wealth had to be, uh, w wealth estimates were the result of, uh, of a modeling exercise. You needed somehow to compute net present values in order to arrive at wealth estimates. Uh, actually, there are some wealth components for land, for instance, for which you have a market. So they, there is clearer guidance for land, um, uh, for uh, statistical institutes, than for subsoil assets. Because for subsoil assets, actually, there is no uh, active and public market uh, where uh, mines or oil fields uh, can be exchanged and where uh, uh, official statisticians could take prices. So in this case, actually, they, they are forced to, to compute the values as the net present uh, value of the, of the profits uh, generated by the, by the deposits. So here, uh, contrary to what happens for land, data av availability is uh, a big issue because national accountants do not know this field and they, 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 they need the input of really mining specialists to be able to estimate uh, extraction costs, uh, which for a given deposit for a single country can be extremely heterogeneous uh, across space. So that really complicates... And time. And time, of course, without saying. Uh, they need uh, the help of mining specialists in order to assess the production constraints uh, at the mine level. Uh, a speaker this morning told us that there was something sure in economics. It was that the uh, uh, hoteling rule did not apply in practice. But uh, actually, there are... Uh, Professors such as Robert Cairns in Canada or Graham Davis in Colorado who try to uh, bridge the gap between the mining engineering literature and the economic literature for the valuation of the subsoil assets. And one of their key elements in order to explain that the hoteling rule does not apply are precisely the production constraints at the deposit level. So in order to estimate it, to assess it, to collect relevant information at the deposit level, the, here you, you, you need to invest a lot more than for land in data collection. Uh, and I would like to end briefly uh, with the UK because um, uh, preparing this discussion I discovered that the UK Treasury uh, annually released so-called uh, all of government accounts and they, they are also mentioned in this book by uh, Detter uh, yeah. and uh, so, but, so we've got at least two sets of balance sheets with different figures for the UK. The accounting uh, uh, framework is not the same, so these uh, all of government accounts um, uh, apply the, the business accounting framework and not the national accounting framework. The asset boundary is different. There are land estimates in the all of government accounts, but not in the national accounts for the UK. And the underlying assumption regarding depreciation of the, over time of the fixed assets may be extremely different. So I would like to end with a, an open question. I, I really wonder whether these two initiatives in the UK could not further converge so as to increase the quality and the readability of the final product. Or, or I also wonder wh whether they, are, they could not merge uh, in the end. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, it would be nice if authorities worldwide would spend a bit, a little bit more money on, uh, on on data collection, statistical analysis. I mean, it's really the ultimate public good is being starved everywhere. So even the GDP data are worse than they used to be, which is really scandalous. Okay, um, uh, Mr. Paul Kazarian. Thank you. Um, I do have slides. Very good. Let's I'm see whether sure we can make a slide make it up there. Yeah. yeah, you're up there. Okay. <laughs> Um, how do we change the slides and to get the order right here? We use magic. All right. So I guess I'm going to need to move somewhere to see. I guess I can see them from right here. Okay. Um, let me see if they work. Yes, they do. Okay. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure. Um, we come at it from a, a different perspective. Um, we are turnaround managers. <laughs> we buy multinational large conglomerates that are in need of being managed and rejuvenated, and we acquire them. So we have a manager hat where I would be a C CEO and also the investor hat. So that's kind of where we look at. Like we actually have to have 100-day plans to get things done. 
which is you know, kind of very different from a more conceptual approach. And I remember my old professor telling me at, at, at Columbia that it wouldn't work in practice if it didn't work in theory. And so, I mean, that kind of stuck in my head. We don't really get involved in the theory side, but we understand the connection. Um, um, we're going to be talking about government net worth, improving decision making, transparency, and accountability. Um, and we're going to be using consolidated financial statements, much like the whole of government accounts you saw at the UK, uh, to measure net worth and thereby improving these factors. Uh, my comments will be in four points. They'll be short. Uh, one is using international accounting standards to measure government net worth. Two is the government net worth definition and key performance metrics, which we call KPIs. Three is debt relief impact on net worth. And four is the importance of correctly measuring balance sheet net debt. So the first point is international accounting standards to measure government net worth. Uh, interesting for those who may or may not read financial statements, um, the government financial statements are extraordinarily granular and provide comprehensive disclosure. They really are remarkable. Um, they're internationally comparable, and they're comparable to the best practice without having a, a, a kind of a, a different approach of kind of moving down to the lowest so they can move up. They set the high standard and that's the bar. So it's kind of a different cultural perspective, less inclusive. Um, they're integrated into four fully integrated financial statements. Those financial statements are statement of financial position, which is known as a balance sheet, the statement of performance, which is your annual performance during the year, the statement of change in net worth, and your cash flow statement. So you use all four tools. Uh, the financial statements are independently audited based on international rules. And the statements are prepared in plain English, hopefully, in a publicly friendly way to provide transparency and accountability if they're written in, in, in a reasonable basis. The IMF has noted this distinction. And they talk about IPSIS, which is the IR, IFRS version, basically, which is used through international companies. They've customized that in the public sector. The UK does use IFRS, but it's a standard. And the IMF recognizes that for decision-making purposes, for like a specific transaction or an event like a lease, a debt buyback, where you don't need regressions or time series, but a specific transaction, accounting standards are very helpful, in fact, essential for transparency and accountability. Again, please don't mistake them for the ability to do covariance or you know, confidence intervals. That's not, you, know, you, you, you don't have that level of depth and data. This is for you know, specific decision making. So the IMF notes the decision there, the distinction there. And you can read more in the sites if you're interested. Uh, second point is government net worth definition and key performance metrics. Again, we use standards, we use the rules. And they happen to be universal for basically all companies and, and what we consider to be the global benchmarks in financial reporting. Um, you have two basic bodies. You have IPSIS, which has been customized, progression from IFRS, which is basically the same thing as US GAAP, uh, with minor differences. But they're internationally comparable. And they're really focused on decision making and the transparency. Global benchmarks include you know, Australia, Austria, France, um, the UK, New Zealand, the, uh, Switzerland, um, public sector organizations, which surprise some many, is that the European Union publishes its own financial statements, and they use international public sector accounting standards, and it's audited by the Court of Auditors. The IMF, the United Nations, the World Bank, they all use the same financial statements, and they're very, very comparable. I mean, they're very easy to read. If you really like and understand them, you'll find them very helpful. Um, and then the in-process examples, the ones who are coming along and starting the process, do include tr a number of troubled com countries like Brazil, um, Russia, and then you have actually the Vatican is initiating uh, IPSIS as well. And you have Portugal and Spain who are making good progress. So that gives you a little background. This is an interesting sheet which shows you actually the net worth using international accounting standards for, for eight different countries. And what you'll see is that on that is that there's like some of them refer to it as net worth, 
Some of them refer to it as an accumulated deficit. Actually, Israel refers to it as equity. So, but it's, it's the same concept, which is assets, as defined by international standards for comparability. I mean, it wouldn't include human capital, which is you know, a very more difficult and non-auditable you know, event and very difficult to do. Um, and you get the Swiss, and you get the United Kingdom. Um, is this slide nine? I think at the bottom, no, that's eight. Um, and this is an interesting one we put together. We went through and we took back, went back to 2011 and showed the change, because this is like the concept of what's actually happening to net worth, which is an interesting point, from 2011 to current, 2014 or 15. UK just came out with their financial statements, I think, two days ago, so this is not updated for them, but it will be. Um, and it doesn't go back much beyond 2010 because most countries didn't have financial statements beyond back before 2010. So it's a relatively new initiative. But what you'll see on that is, is, is it's small. We can give you copies of this if you'd like later. Is that New Zealand actually has kind of a, a, a net worth change that's positive. Mm -hmm. Many of them are negative because you've had the change in evolving. And it, it's not when you read their financial statements, you won't see this, even in Sweden. Or, yeah, Sweden, which writes them, and the UK has the, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, which prepares a report. And they also don't marry accounts together with GDP or changes. It's a very line item review. But what's interesting on this, if you look at Greece, and you look at their change, which is on the left, and they don't have financial statements, so we've had four major accounting firms work on this for almost four years to try to develop you know what process, and it is hugely time consuming, has been very expensive. But it was something you need this to be able to think. The team of accountants is now, what, 25 that is working on this from all four firms. So it's a massive effort for just like one number. Um, and what you'll see is that their net worth has actually increased by 44%. The negative has gotten and less so. And it's not because of positive fiscal management. It's because they've had a series of massive debt reliefs. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how do you account for that debt relief? And there are standards that you follow. So you'll see that, which is, is, was interesting here. Um, that's a chart. Um, some of the ways we look at them, which I think goes into Dog's point, Dog Dieter's point, which we've talked about in the past, is to look at return on assets. And I actually think in your piece that you've written, uh, your seminal 62-page like, you know, uh, public wealth, you talk about if there's a, like a 1% change in assets, what impact would that have? If, I think that's correct, right? Yeah. We look at it a little differently, but very similarly, from a manager's point of view, we look at a gap. And we look at like the best performing and where you currently are to see how actually big that gap is. And what we do is we take change in net worth over the years or over a historical period of time, you can average them. And you divide that by your assets. And lo and behold, if you divide your change in net worth for the period by your assets, you end up with a return on assets. Does it make any difference if you privatize the best ones? I'm sorry? Does it make any difference if you privatize? Um, it doesn't matter, it could be either way. It could be either way. Yeah. Yeah. You just get, you know. I, I'm not really sure of your question, but we can go through it. I want to answer it correctly, so I want to make sure I understand it. Uh, but what you'll see is the changes, and we've done historical averages, so you can get the entire period. And we have them by year if you'd like them and back up, so that's fine, but this is for summary purposes. And then you see the averages. You'll see New Zealand comes in, you know, at a minus two, kind of the more recent average. Um, and then, or, or if you look at the historical average, they're a positive four, which is one of the few. And unfortunately for us, the U.S. is a minus 38%. And when you actually do look at the financials, it becomes fairly apparent why they're a minus 38% in like, return on assets. Um, and, and again, you can criticize what's in their deficits as a percentage of revenue, which is how we look at it, is really out of control. But they don't, that's just not a concept because we're a reserve currency and kind of a powerful nation. Um, net worth is a percentage of GDP. And again, you can argue you know, what's in there. The UK is the only whole of government. The others are more central government, what's included, what's not included. But this is a very good start, and it's fertile ground for analysis of financial statements. I mean, you can't do historical, but it's a good way if you really want to start understanding like, you know, what's happening there. Um, look at a percentage of GDP, which is the other way we look at it. And if you look at the change, you'll see New Zealand actually has a positive net worth, and it cascades down to Israel having a minus 158% net 
deficit as it's printed in net worth. I mean, these are like real numbers. And they're, they are prepared according to international accounting standards. France uses three different standards. They use the rules. They use um, IAS, which is IFRS, and they use IPSIS as well, but they called it IFACS, Public Sector Initiative. And so there's like, but th th there's an, eff an effort there. And by the way, France is adjusted for the, the, the pensions. So we took them off the footnotes and we put them on. And for the UK, we adjusted it. If I'm not mistaken, there is 245 billion of uh, uh, property assets and a footnote for the UK, which they do not put on their financial statements. It's the local uh, roads, which we put in because we read the footnotes and we have to adjust them for comparability. That's really important. Going through quickly, we do net worth changes to see how has this net worth changed over the period. We look at go as far back as you can, but you'll see the historical averages. You can see the difference. Some of them improving, some of them cascade down. Most of them are negative, um, I think, except for the Swiss, which is 1%. But it's a good way to get the train, and you can understand like, where they're actually progressing. Um, this is one of the most interesting ratio we have. And we've been working on this with a couple of think tanks, which is to try to marry the economist's perspective and focus on the Uber number GDP, which you know stocks flows, I mean, just hold off on that for a moment, but it's a, a significant number. And we marry that with the accounting concept of change in net worth. So by taking the two, what we've taken, I know it's a flow number, we've had this discussion, but if you take that change in net worth and, and you take the change in GDP and you divide them, you can actually begin to see how much your GDP costs your government in terms of their change in financial net worth, which is a very interesting way to pull them together. We call it the value creation ratio. And we give the government full credit for the GDP change. I know that's not true, but rather than try to break out private sector and public sector, it's a, it's a start. And we'll give them full credit for it. They don't really probably get full credit, but at least we'll give you a, a relative sense of the numbers. Uh, debt relief. What you've heard and, and the dialogue with regard to Greece, which kind of gets into the importance of numbers, is you've heard with this third program that Greece hasn't received any debt relief. And just hear this over and over again. And you hear people say, well, why should you put the debt on the books at anything less than phase? Because if they went bankrupt, it wouldn't be on. And it's like, well, let's just step back a minute and ask you what's happened here. You're getting a triple C credit is getting basically a uniquely extraordinary concession loan with maturities out as far as, I think, 45 years, Chris, and interest rates at three quarters of a percent. That's a grant, almost. And when you have a financial statement, that has to be accounted for as a change in net worth because that's where it all comes down. So when you do a T account, you'll see that as that happens, if you're going to have financial statements, you'd have to show the change in net worth, obviously. And you'll see that this number that they say doesn't exist by any standards works out to, I think, about a $17 billion increase in your net worth. I mean, logically, you could just walk it through, take the time. It's very, very sound. When you go through the full program, you actually get 46 billion of an increase in their net worth. This is, these are numbers I don't really like talk because there's, there's no, this marriage of economists and statisticians and financiers and counters that seems to be very siloed in nature. Much like in our companies when we typically buy them, I'll get the marketing department, we'll really talk to the R&D department and we're trying to produce new products so they don't get the flow and just, it happens a lot. And we see this kind of same siloed nature. So we try to you know, pull them all together. And that's how you kind of move this forward. Um, and on the debt, it's the last point. Um, again, the number that's being used now is called a future face value, which is basically a political number. It means if you had debt due 100 years from now with zero interest, it would go on at that future face value 100 years from now. If you did the same with pensions or any other liability, it'd be absolutely exploded. Well, there are different rules. Greece, for example, has, I think, 400 you know, different financial instruments that have to be valued, and it is very time consuming because you can't really do a shortcut. But what you see, which is very unique here, is that because of the extraordinary concessional repetitive loans, the typical number that's talked about is 178% GDP, which is this future face value, which isn't an economics number, it's a kind of a political number, is 154% appears. It appears massive. When you account for it properly, using the, the, the rules IFRS, IPSIS, US GAAP, it doesn't matter. I mean, any of the rules, it, actually, it, it drops 
And when you look at net debt, which is your financial assets disclosures, you see it declines to around 39% or 49% of peers. So you get this massive flip-flop of being hugely over-debted to adjusting for each concession alone when it occurred. And you kind of go through that, go through quickly. We have the details on it if you want to see the background. It's, it's, it's obviously, we, we find it very interesting. Um, one myth, we just, it's not in economics, it's the last slide, is that this notion that Maastricht debt requires nominal to be disclosed, and you hear that all the time, that's not accurate. Legally reviewed, it's not accurate. Maastricht does say nominal, however, it's been superseded by ESA, 2000, ESA 95 and ESA 2010, and, and, it, and it's sequenced in these different regulations, EC 490, 479, 209, sequence it through, and it says if you look at ESA 2010, section 2236, that when you have rescheduled debt, it is considered extinguished and replaced with a new transaction value, and it's very specific that it should be the market value based on commercial considerations. This is actually kind of a misreading. And then this is, um, let, this is the last slide. You know, some of the methodology of trying to estimate financial assets it's very, very difficult. This was one recent paper that came out that estimated that Greece had 295 billion of financial assets. Like it doesn't have 295 billion. They went back, I think, and used a 1993 UN study on net worth and then projected it forward and then took a bifurcation of public and private assets based on a relative percentage and then calculated the financial assets. I mean, that's just, it's not, it's not a real asset number. So financial statements are really important. And I think that's it, and that's my 10 minutes. Um, but if anybody needs any backup on this or details or Excel spreadsheets, you know we're happy to go through them with you. Great. Um, I am going to interject at this point, panel, uh, to say thank you very much indeed. Uh, we're t our time is up, very sadly, and I'm not going to allow us to slip on time. I would have loved to have had a very rich discussion about public wealth. But instead, we had three very rich presentations. So thank you very much. Thank you, Willem. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Pierre.